Good morning. Uh, welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. My name is Matt Skinner. I am on the staff here as the Scholar for Adult Education. Uh, we're glad that some of you have joined us here in person. We're glad for the many of you watching online as well uh, for what will be a, a rich morning and really a full day of events uh, with, our, with our guests. If you're familiar with Bethlehem, it's uh, not just a, a, a city uh, there today. It has a long, long, long history. Uh, most of uh, most people in the Christian church remember Bethlehem as the place where Jesus Christ was born. Even before that, Bethlehem has had a history of being a place uh, where God engineers surprises. Uh, some of that goes back to, uh, to the book of Ruth, uh, where Ruth, uh, a woman from neighboring Moab, pledges herself uh, to her mother-in-law, who is a refugee from Bethlehem, uh, fleeing the city because of a uh, food crisis. Uh, they come back to Bethlehem and experience as well a kind of um, tangible and fleshed example of God's sustaining covenantal love um, when they re return to the city. A couple of generations later, uh, the prophet Samuel discovers that God's choice for the next king is a shepherd boy who lives in Bethlehem. Uh, Bethlehem is still a place where God engineers surprises, uh, where God is at work in ways both seen and unseen, and one of the ways in which that happens today uh, is through the work of Dara Kalama University, which is, uh, was founded and is now led by its president, the Reverend Dr. Mitri Raheb. Uh, Mitri is a friend uh, to this congregation and to many congregations in the Twin Cities. Uh, he served for 20 years, I believe, as senior pastor of Christmas Lutheran Church in Bethlehem and now devotes himself to the leadership of Dar Kalama. Uh, if you aren't familiar with this university, it's a university of arts and culture. Uh, its vision is to spread the values of democracy, freedom of expression, and the freedom of thought in order to build a conscious and free Palestinian civil society. Uh, we're thrilled to offer Mitri here today to speak to us about the history, conditions, and future of Palestinian Christians. So without any further ado, uh, well, join me please in welcoming the Reverend Dr. Mishri Rahab. Thank you. Good morning everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you uh, this morning, actually the whole day. I hope you will not be tired of me after uh, six different events. Um, but really what a joy to be here, and I love this hall, you know, this is my favorite hall here when it was inaugurated, and we had here a great uh, dinner, and it reminds me uh, so much actually of Dar al-Kalima, but the most important thing, it's you, the members, the pastors of this church that I feel very much uh, connected uh, to. Um, I mean, uh, Matt, you know, as a professor, he gave me a title that, you know, we could spend one week talking about it. It's the history and the present time of the Christians in the Middle East, in, in Palestine. Um, but I will try maybe to have a short introduction. Uh, and then I think many of you are familiar with the situation, so I would love to engage in, in dialogue. You know, I mean, when we talk about history, it's not easy for a church to endure one occupation after the other. And I think this is maybe one feature of the church in Palestine. Um, because imagine when Jesus was born, he was born under occupation, right? Roman occupation. And the church for the, for the first three centuries uh, was living under occupation. Uh, then came the Byzantines, uh, you know, when the empire became Christian. But unfortunately, when the empire be became Christian, it also persecuted the local, the native Christians, because they were not Greek. So it wasn't the best time for our forefathers. <laughs> then came the Arabs. Uh, and at the beginning, it was a good time. It was a relief from the Byzantines. They, they thought that was a relief. 
which was for maybe two centuries, but then actually it became very difficult. Uh, and actually uh, Christianity uh, uh, was facing some tough time. Then came the Crusaders, uh, and they didn't like the native Christians. They thought the native Christians, they look Muslim, so they persecuted them like the others. And actually, until the, until the, um, uh, the Crusaders came, Christians were still the majority in Palestine. When the Crusaders left, the cr Christianity was becoming a minority. Because... Uh, even the, the, the rulers who came after the, the Ayyubites, if they are called, when they came after uh, the Crusaders, uh, they somehow connected the local Christians with the West. Anyhow, uh, 1517, you know that, that it's a Lutheran date, sorry, but it's right? Uh, you know, when Luther hung, you know, the 95 uh, theses on the uh, church in Wittenberg, the percentage of Christians was 7% only. Interestingly enough, under Ottoman rule, which was a Muslim rule, and it wasn't always an easy rule, but the percentage of Christians grew from 7% to 25%. Very few people know this, actually. And so, so that's just history, <laughs> you know, in three minutes, like. Uh, if we start 1917, uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, we did the research, um, and we found out that 1917, two-third of all schools in Palestine were run by churches. Can you believe it? Although the church only made 11% of the population, which means two-thirds of the population, irrespective of they were Muslims or Christians, went to Christian schools, Catholic, Protestant, and few Orthodox. But 1917 also was the date when Lord Balfour actually uh, promised the land to Israel. I always like to say it wasn't the, the Lord God who promised Israel the land, it was Lord Balfour. And these are two different things, you know. Uh, and and um, uh, if you read the Balfour Declaration, he wanted to have... Uh, a, a home for the Jewish people and there is no mention for the Christians who were 11% or the Muslims who were over uh, 85%. Uh, and so that was for us a time of, of struggle. However, uh, during Ottoman uh, period, there were 13 churches. They were recognized uh, by the Ottomans uh, and then by the British um, and by the Jordanian government that are still today the recognized churches. These are like Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholics, many churches, like Syrian Catholic, and so on. Uh, and among the Protestant churches, two churches are recognized, the Anglican and the Lutherans. Uh, Presbyterians at that time, you know, decided they are always smart, you know, the Presbyterians. They thought Palestine is, you know, too small for Presbyterians. So they went to Egypt, to Egypt and they went to Syria. And uh, this is where actually the largest Protestant churches in the Middle East are found today. Uh, but there was a gentleman agreement that uh, Presbyterians will not start churches in Palestine and Lutherans will not start churches in Egypt and in Syria, which is still in effect actually until today. Um, just in the last uh, two years, uh, we worked hard actually with the Palestinian Authority uh, to recognize uh, in a different category the many other small churches like Baptists um, uh, and other churches, uh, 
So they were recognized just two years ago by the Palestinian Authority. They are not yet recognized by Israel. So in Israel, they are not recognized as churches. So this is just maybe to give you an, an overview. If we look at the numbers today, the Christians are, make less than 2% of the population. Inside Israel, if we look at historic Palestine, inside Israel, Christians make 1.3% of the population. In numbers, we are talking about 120,000 Christians. In the West Bank, uh, there are 47,000 Christians. They make 1.7% of the population. In Gaza, among 2 million people, we have less than 1,000 Christians left which means we know within this generation, Christianity will cease to exist actually in Gaza, which is for me, it's really very hurting because Gaza used to be the mission hub uh, for the whole areas in the southern part of Palestine. All the missionaries came out of Gaza at that time. But Gaza is a big open air prison. Nobody can come in, out. Even if the Christians uh, sometimes get a permit to come to Christmas, to Bethlehem, most of them, they don't return to Gaza. And who blames them? And yet, last year, we did a very interesting study about uh, the impact of the Christian community in Palestine today. And um, it was amazing uh, what we found. One, we found out that uh, if we took, uh, we looked at 296 church-related organizations operating today in Palestine, 296 organizations church-related. We found out that if we take them together, they constitute the third largest employer in Palestine. The first, the largest employer is the government. <laughs> The second largest is the UN, which operates in the refugee camps. But these 296 organizations, they employ about 10,000 people. Now, remember, the Christians in the West Bank, they, they make 47,000 people. They employ 10,000 people. And we found out even more interesting that when we looked at the uh, all non-governmental organizations, not only the church-related organizations, the non-governmental organizations, we found out that 45% of all non-governmental organizations in Palestine were either started by Christians or are run by Christians, which means Christians play a very important role in the civil society in Palestine. And the last thing that we found out, which is stunning, is that these, these 296 organizations, church-related organizations, they pump into the Palestinian economy every year, guess how much? $500 million. That is almost the same amount that Palestine gets in donor aid from all countries, including the U.S., which means churches actually are still playing, though we are less than 2%, are still playing a major role in what's happening in Palestine today. And I think uh, Dar al Kalama University is just one example of this uh, thriving organization. But what also we found, which was uh, a bit worrying, is that many of these 296 church-related organization will not make it in the next decade. And one reason why they cannot make it is lack of leadership. When we looked at the leadership of these church-related organizations, we found out that most of the leaders are either very old and they don't want to give a chance for the next generation, or they didn't have an adequate um, education, they don't have the adequate skills, and so their organizations are actually getting smaller and smaller, and there is a lack of vision. And so we thought, what can we do if we really want to 
to help Christianity in Palestine not only survive but thrive, what can we do? And we thought as university, maybe the best thing we can do is to offer a kind of master degrees in uh, running church-related organization and non-for-profit organization. And asking these organizations to send one, a, a, a potential future leader that has a bachelor that maybe is involved in that organization, but who needs really the skills to take this organization into the next level. And so starting this September, we will offer two new master degrees at the university. One of them is a kind of MBA for church-related organizations. And actually, uh, we are offering every organization a, a half a scholarship to send, uh, to send somebody from there. We hope to start the first cohort with 20 people, with 20 organizations. And I hope and pray that actually this will help us actually help these organizations um, not only to survive but to thrive. So please keep us in your prayers. This is a major, a major step. Uh, but we felt this is what needs to be done uh, here and now. Uh, another problem uh, which the church in, uh, in Palestine is, is, uh, is facing is the occupation, the Israeli occupation with all its constraints. And to give you an example of what this means, for example, for the Christian community in Jerusalem, just as one example. In Jerusalem today, we have uh, only 7,000 Christians left. Uh, 1917, we had uh, 28,000 Christians. So you can imagine, today they should have been maybe 150,000 Christians in Jerusalem. Today there are only 7,000. But these 7,000, uh, the, the challenges they face are immense. And especially when it comes, I mean, let, let, let me say it differently. 7,000, many of them are older, many children, not too many, because the average family size, Christian family size today is 1.9. So most of the families have only two kids, the Christian families. So, but how many do you think are there maybe in, in, in the marriage, uh, marriage age? Not many, few hundred. They cannot marry but among themselves. Because if somebody from Jerusalem, a Christian, would fall in love with somebody from Bethlehem, which is only five miles, they cannot be together. Israel doesn't allow them. So, and for them, that will be hell. I mean, how can you get married without living together? Uh, to give you an example, my colleague, uh, a young Lutheran pastor, He's from Ramallah. He fell in love with, uh, you know, another Lutheran from Jerusalem. They got married. On their honeymoon, they couldn't travel together. <laughs> so she went through Tel Aviv, Ben-Gurion. He, uh, he went through Amman, and they met in Thailand. Now, when they got the first child, uh, and... Um, I think uh, he was like three months old. They wanted to travel. Um, the mother couldn't take the child with her. So the father had to take the child through Amman, though uh, uh, she was still breastfeeding him. And so, so that is a big challenge. Uh, and... Uh, uh, we have now, uh, I have now five pre presidents at the university. One of them, a great colleague, uh, Varsin, she's an Armenian Christian. Um, she's from Jerusalem. But if you are a Palestinian living in Jerusalem and you leave Jerusalem for more than one year, you lose your right to stay in Jerusalem. 
So imagine, I mean, how many Christians are studying abroad, etc. And um, uh, so they took her ID, and she cannot travel. Actually, she's supposed to be with us in, in Cyprus next week at our conference. She cannot. She's stuck. She can go nowhere because she lost her ID just because she, she went to Canada for some time. So this is the challenges that are facing the Christian community today because of the Israeli occupation. But one, another challenge is uh, leadership. The leadership of the church right now is in a mess. The Greek Orthodox Church, which constitute 40% of the Palestinian Christians, they have a Greek patriarch, and all the leaderships are Greek nationals. And they are not interested very much into the Palestinian community. The Roman Catholic Church, uh, which 1988, uh, uh, they had the first Palestinian patriarch, now they went back to having an Italian patriarch. Um, and so really only the Protestant churches, they have Palestinian indigenous leadership, but unfortunately also not, not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, uh, the most uh, maybe skilled leaders, so to say. So that's the situation and the challenge we are facing. Uh, today in Palestine, and when I look at the at the young uh, at the young uh, Christians, and that's the last thing I would like to say. Um, many of them are very. For them, Christianity means a lot. They are ready to fight for their Christian faith, though they have no knowledge of what Christian faith really means. <laughs> It's a kind of a tribal. This wasn't always like that. But right now, this is my feeling. It's a kind of a tribal belonging, lacking the depth and the width of what actually the Christian faith is all about. Um, so we are trying also to work with these young people. In fact, in two weeks, uh, we have... Um, a retreat uh, with 25 young people from all churches uh, where we are going to, to talk about uh, uh, the role of young people today in the church in Palestine. I think I will stop here. Um, I think I, uh, my time is up and um, I'm ready to hear your questions because I think we need really to, to engage in a dialogue. Sure, and we have plenty of time for questions and for discussion. Uh, I'll just ask people in the room to put their hands up so I can bring the microphone to you. That will help our friends online hear what's going on. And people online, we're also monitoring the, the chat on the live stream. So feel free to enter your comments and questions there. All right, I'll do my, I'm gonna date myself and do a Phil Donahue impersonation. So <laughs> he was a trailblazer here in the United States. Oh, Mitri, uh, is it your hope, this is a question in regard to the masters in nonprofit administration that you are soon initiating or have initiated. Is it your hope that uh, graduates from that program might become secular leaders of uh, uh, religious organizations in, in Palestine? Yeah, actually, um our main target are, uh, are, are potential leaders from these church-related organizations, but we are opening uh, the program also for other non-for-profit uh, organizations, and, uh, including Muslim organizations or secular organizations. And the idea is twofold. First of all, we think it would be great if, if, uh, if these um, Christian leaders from the Christian organizations will study together and will work together. This will foster the ecumenical uh, work in Palestine. But also working with leaders from the Muslim community and from the secular community will position these, these Christian leaders to have a network 
uh, not only an interfaith network, but also a national network, which will be uh, of importance for them in the future. So this is, uh, this is how we designed, actually, this master degrees. We have a question over here. Uh, uh, th this is just something that's been in my mind for a long time, and uh, being that you're close to that. Why is it that the Palestine, the, excuse me, the, the Jewish Israel state treats Palestine like they were treated by Hitler in World War II? They, they sort of flipped it. it. That's my conjecture. So tell me if I'm wrong, and then tell me if you have an answer for that. It's very difficult to see why. Uh, some people, uh, uh, psychologists, they think uh, people who were, uh, who were persecuted often tend to persecute others once they get in power. I think this is one. But secondly, most probably, I think, because uh, they have a kind of impunity, because whatever they do, really, nobody uh, calls them uh, to... Um, uh, uh, for accountability. Um, uh, and they receive, I always say, they receive so much funding and so much uh, political uh, backing, including from the U.S., that they don't feel uh, a need to change their practices. Uh, I, th I believe once they, the Israelis start paying for the occupation from their own pocket, the second day they will stop it. But unfortunately, other people are paying for the occupation, and so they can afford it. Uh, I, I've heard you before and, and read some of your things. Uh, the Christians are diminishing in numbers, and you gave some of that here. And my question is why, since they are kind of a mediating force in that situation, why is Israel happy to get rid of Christians? <laughs> uh, because then they're left only with the Muslim. Maybe that's, that's a strategy. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, um, I think uh, actually Israel, that's my, my, my theory at least, uh, that actually Israel uh, would love to see Palestine without Christians uh, for two reasons, I think. One, if there is no Christians, Israel can market the situation as a conflict between Muslims and Jews, which would sell very well in the West. That's one. But secondly, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the Jewish... Uh, population uh, used to have access in the West to anywhere they wanted. I mean, here in the States, they are very much established in, you know, in, in all fields because they have been here for a long time. Now, they are not yet afraid of the Muslims because Muslims are newcomers and they are still trying to find their way. I mean, there is a big difference now, say, to 20 years ago when I look at the Muslim community, because now you have here the second generation, third generation of Muslims who have been born here. They, they know the culture. They know the language. They, have, they are starting to have access. But the Christians are the ones who are having, Palestinian Christians, having access. And they don't like that. They don't like a Palestinian Christian like myself standing here at Westminster Presbyterian Church in downtown Minneapolis in a large church talking to a community because they wanted all the time to control the narrative that only their, their version of the narrative will be spread, not only in the media, but also in churches, etc. We are challenging that, and this is why you know, I think they think we are the stumbling block. I always say Jesus was a stumbling block, so we are in good tradition, you know. So. Good morning. Good morning. I'd love to know how you recruited the youth for this retreat. 
if they are from all aspects of the religious spectrum? Yeah, um, I contacted uh, a Catholic uh, colleague who is responsible for the youth work in the Catholic Church. He will send seven people. Uh, I contacted a Christian ecumenical organization in Jerusalem. They will send five. Uh, I contacted the Greek Orthodox and uh, a Lutheran colleague. They will send some of their church uh, from their, their youth. And this is how we are actually bringing them together. A lot of evangelical churches in the United States uh, send groups uh, to the Middle East. What contact do those groups have with Palestinian Christians? Yeah, a good question. Uh, you know, many, unfortunately, of the large uh, evangelical groups, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't contact us. They think Palestinian Christians are not kosher enough. Uh, thinking somebody like, you know, John Hagee or, you know, all of these crazy televangelists uh, who are anxious for Armageddon. All, I mean, they are obsessed with the second coming of Christ and they want all the Jews to go to Palestine so that two-thirds of them will be killed and the third-third will convert to Christianity. So are actually, they are the most anti-Semitic groups, but for the time being, they want to support Israel because they are anxious for Armageddon. And so we don't agree with their theology, and we don't agree with their politics, and we don't agree with their human agenda. We think this is a very dangerous group. But... We cannot throw all evangelicals in the same uh, pot, box, because uh, there are many evangelicals who didn't hear any other story but a Zionist story. But they are open, and so I always think of, of the prophet Isaiah who was asking, uh, how they will hear if nobody is sent to them. And so this is why I feel, uh, you know, we are saying God send us. And so we have been actually uh, doing uh, trips to this country, to the U.S., to try to reach out to those evangelicals who are open-minded and are eager to hear. To hear. So in March, I was in Dallas, uh, uh, meeting with some of these evangelical leaders. In October of this year, we are planning a big conference, targeting evangelicals in Texas. You know, I mean, we wanted to go to the belly of the beast, right? I mean, it's... Uh, so we have a big conference there in October that we are organizing. Um, and in, in, uh, in November, we have another conference that we are uh, actually we are organizing together with PCUSA in Chile uh, on Christian Zionism, because Christian Zionism is not anymore just a problem in the U.S. Today, it's much, a much bigger problem in the global south. In Latin America, in Africa, you have, you know, Christian Zionism is mushrooming. And we want, again, to challenge that, to combat that. And the last thing, when we talk about evangelicals, um, there is a new generation of evangelicals. If we look at the young evangelicals, for many of them, the, and we compare them with the older evangelicals, the older evangelicals were ob obsessed with the second coming, with Armageddon. The young evangelicals, many of them, not all, but many of them, uh, they are interested in justice issues. And when we talk about justice, I mean, <laughs> Palestine is the justice cause per excellence. And so some of them are actually are, are speaking up. Uh, uh, two days ago, when I was in medicine, I guess, uh, yeah, I'm every day in another uh, uh, 
yeah, I think it was in medicine. Uh, I met with a young evangelical who just finished, actually, two days ago, the same day, he defended his PhD and uh, got the title director, uh, doc doctor, and then uh, uh, drove from Chicago extra all the way to medicine to meet with me. Um, and uh, because he did his PhD about higher education in Palestine, with a focus on, on our university, Bethlehem University, etc. Um, but uh, it's, it's really interesting because he starts his, his PhD with his conversion as, as a young evangelical growing in a free church, hearing all about Israel, thinking that the state of Israel is the fulfillment of the prophecies, and then experiencing a kind of a conversion after the killing of a young uh, Palestinian girl through an Israeli sniper. And that actually brought him to think about the conflict. And this is how he got interested in Palestine. Uh, and it's amazing, uh, I mean, what he did. Uh, I mean, uh, and the way he connected his story with, with, with Palestine. So anyhow, he, he, for me, he represents this new generation uh, maybe some of you know somebody like uh, Claiborne. Um, I forgot the first name. Shane Claiborne, yeah. He, he represents these young evangelicals who are still evangelicals, but uh, very much interested in justice. And Palestine for him became one, one of the issues, really, he, he talked about it in his, in his books. So, so that is the kind, I mean, this is the process how I see it. The university provides so much leadership development for the tourism uh, business, which is such a huge part of the Palestinian economy. Do you see ways in which that uh, leadership preparation for the tourism industry can work with the new uh, MBAs for nonprofits and reinforce the commitment to justice through, I mean, they see all these tourists. Um, do you see some way of connecting the leadership development for the tourism industry with the nonprofit sector? Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Maybe just to give uh, our friends here a bit of a background. Um, until 1995, Palestinians were not allowed to become tour guides. It was prohibited. Why? Because Israel wanted that all the groups who come to visit Israel and Palestine will hear the Jewish narrative. Uh, and interestingly enough, the head of tourism in Palestine was an Israeli military general, which shows that Israel saw in tourism like a, a battlefield. And so it needed a general to run that. 95, when the Palestinian Authority was established, tourism was one sector that was handed over to the Palestinians. At that time, we did a feasibility study, 95. That was one of our first projects that we worked on. And we found out that there are around 4,000 uh, guides, Jewish guides, working in Israel and only 60 Palestinian guides active. All of them had their, um, their, um, uh, their um, like, um, papers from the Jordanians. So you can imagine, so they did their, uh, you know, they got their license before 67, and they were dying out. So one of the first program we, de we, de we designed, actually, is to start training uh, guides. We weren't a college, we weren't a university, but we started this as, as, a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a training program. Uh, today, I can say there are around 500 Palestinian guides active. 40% of them are graduates of Dar al Karima. And this is for us important because this is how also we can offer a different narrative than the Zionist narrative. 
uh, and we focused on training also Palestinian Christian guides because many of the Christian groups they would like to have also a Christian guide to be with them who can when they pray he can pray with them he understand uh, etc um, yeah so that's maybe just one I see Tim is yeah Mitri I have two questions are you checking your watch I'm not saying we're done <laughs> two questions one uh, and they're I don't think they're related. Uh, first has to do with uh, how Americans often equate what's happening with uh, is Israel and Jewish attitudes, policies, behavior, violence toward Palestinians with uh, Germany in the 30s and 40s. Uh, genocide in the latter case, uh, violence and oppression in the former case. How do you uh, respond to people who, who kind of uh, mesh those uh, two uh, narratives. The genocide happening with the, the Christian Germans killing Jews and uh, equating that with what's happening in Israel and Palestine. Yeah. Um, a, a difficult question. Uh, I know um, um, Actually, uh, I know that uh, Jewish uh, uh, friends would not like this, you know, this comparison, uh, which I understand. Um, but then I see them using this when, when it suits them. For example, uh, I mean... Uh, 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 Saddam Hussein was compared with Hitler. It's okay then, you know what I, what I mean? Or the, now Putin is compared with Hitler. So when, when, when it suits them, they use it. But usually, uh, they don't like it. What I say, that's my, now, my answer, is that uh, every suffering is unique. You really cannot compare any suffering with the other. And I think, uh, and for me as a pastor, I'm talking. I mean, when, when I was, uh, you know, dealing with, 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 with the church members who were suffering, you know, you have to take every suffering very serious as if it is the suffering of the whole world. And starting to compare sometimes is helpful, but often it doesn't help you to hear what the story is of that particular person, of that particular group. So this is why I think it's difficult to compare. Uh, but my problem is somewhere else. My problem is when Israel or the Jewish people uh, claim monopoly over suffering. That's my problem. Like no other group suffered like them. I don't buy into that because thinking of the Native Americans. <laughs> I mean, historians tell us between 15 to 50 million people were killed. Who is telling their story? They don't claim monopoly. I mean, the enslavement, 400 years of enslavement of the African Americans. Who is telling their story? Uh, and so that is where I like to challenge uh, my, my Jewish friends. I know it's unique, but no monopoly. Thank you. Uh, maybe the second question is related to that. <laughs> uh, you and, and Doug Mitchell and Elena and I were uh, at 38th in Chicago, George Floyd Square, yesterday. And uh, wondering if you might reflect a moment about your experience there. And I'm particularly interested in and where you hear voices of hope in, in a context like that, and where you find your own voice of hope in your context. How, how do you find hope? And what was your, did you hear any hope at 38th in Chicago yesterday? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, yesterday we went to George Floyd uh, Square, uh, a group of uh, maybe 20 pastors and uh, several uh, uh, leaders from different churches, including Westminster. Uh, and for me, that was really a very moving experience. Uh, I didn't want to be in the Twin Cities without 
paying a tribute uh, to uh, to George Floyd and the many, many, many uh, uh, African American who really, uh, I mean, I think uh, yesterday uh, we heard it that they came a uh, long way, but still the road is <laughs> still very long. And sometimes you feel, uh, you know, this is like the long Saturday where you ask yourself, oh Lord, how long? How long, oh Lord? But where I, I, I saw uh, hope actually in, in, in several moments. One is when, uh, when the African-American uh, woman, uh, I forgot her name, uh, who spoke to us at the end, uh, started talking actually and recognizing that her house uh, is on, on land of Native American. And she started 500 years ago with the oppression of the Native Americans. And for me, that was a, a very important moment because often, you know, oppressed people, uh, they are so much observed with their own uh, uh, pain that they don't see the pains of others. This is my problem with the, with the Israeli narrative, is that they are so much observed that they don't look at our narrative. Uh, the other uh, uh, piece where uh, it was, uh, I was moved to see how, how churches are so much involved there that even, you know, uh, I think Ashley uh, is her name, uh, she, she goes there every, every day twice at seven in the morning, at six in the evening. Uh, I mean, this is a commitment uh, that, that um, and, and then at the end they were spoken about community, uh, how important this community is. So I found their uh, hope um, But again, it's a, it's a long it's a long way uh, to go. Uh, it's a long Saturday for uh, I think for all of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think this is I think this is like the concluding question. I think uh, Tim. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, when 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 you look at what's happening in Palestine. Uh, you feel um, you cannot be optimistic. Um, because uh, the forces of oppression and the systemic oppression, I think this is what, what yesterday uh, was obvious. This is not like, this is a systemic oppression. And uh, that is not going away soon. And by the way, another hope, uh, uh, which uh, yesterday, I mean, I was thinking after 500 years, the Native Americans are still resilient. With after killing so many of them, they are still there hanging on. The African American, after all of this enslavement, they are hanging in there, you know, uh, uh, fighting for their rights. For me, that's a sign of hope. And uh, uh, at Bright Stars of Bethlehem, uh, uh, here, uh, our tagline is, hope is what we do. And for me, that was uh, in, uh, important because often I felt that uh, many Palestinians were either hopeless, thinking it's over, we cannot do anything, which meant either we become fundamentalists <laughs> or we immigrate. And I refuse both. So what is the alternative? And another group of Palestinians, uh, uh, they were laying back, hoping that uh, uh, liberation will come riding on a white horse to take us from our misery. God will do it somehow, or Biden will do it, Obama will do it, Trump will do it. 
And I always like to tell these people, you know, uh, why wait for another Messiah? Uh, our Messiah came 2,000 years ago, and we know it for a fact because he was born just across the street from where, where I was born. <laughs> so why wait for another, right? He said what needed to be said. He did what needed to be done, and the ball is in our court. Either we do it because we were empowered by the Spirit to do it, or we leave it. And so hope is really what we do. I think this is like a concluding. We have a couple minutes for some announcements. Ah, How okay. about that? Let me oh, good, good. invite all of you to join us uh, for worship at 1030. If you're a guest, you can follow the crowd. Uh, Mitri will be preaching uh, for Pentecost Sunday. And then also to return at 230 uh, in the afternoon in the sanctuary, correct? For a panel discussion on the next generation of creative leaders in Palestine, the power of the arts and education. Uh, busy day. Plus, I think you're even teaching at Central Lutheran somewhere in between there. So you might see him walking down the street as well if you go outside. Uh, but let's uh, all join together in thanking one more time Michi Rahab. Thank you very much.